Good morning, Facebook family. Um, welcome to Brookfield Zoo's Animal Hospital. Uh, we are working with Melina, one of our new tigers here at the zoo. And I'm being joined here today by uh, Dr. Steven Jurega from the Veterinary Dental Center. Dr. Jurega does a lot of our dental work for us with more advanced procedures. Melina is a new animal here at the zoo. Um, she just recently arrived um, and has moved through the hospital, so this is her incoming animal exam. So every new animal at the zoo uh, has a full health checkup when they arrive. In Melina's case, we knew that we were gonna need a little bit of dental work because uh, she came from the, uh, the zoo in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and on the exit exam, when she was leaving their zoo, they noted that she had a fractured uh, canine tooth. And so what Dr. Jurega is working on today is a repair of that tooth. Um, Melina is an Amur tiger. She comes to us at the age of 10 years old, so she's a little bit of an older animal, and this is one of the great ways that we're able to support the uh, breeding program for these majestic cats is to house older animals. So right now we don't have a breeding pair of tigers here at the zoo, um, but what we can do is support other zoos that do have active breeding pairs um, by providing a great home for some of the older animals. So Melina's coming to us um, a little bit older um, than what we would normally bring an animal in at, but we're able to provide a great home for her here at Brookfield Zoo. Um, she's an Amur tiger, which is the largest of the uh, different subspecies of tigers. So Molina weighs in at about 250 pounds, but the males of this subspecies actually get up to be about 650 pounds, and they are the largest of all of the big cats. So they're really just an incredible animal to work with. You'll see the rest of our team here is still working on just a general health checkup on her. So uh, Dr. Aiken Palmer there was just taking a feel of her back legs, um, checking her joints, making sure that everything feels like it's comfortable. As an older animal, we know that she has a little bit of arthritic change in some of her joints. So we're just taking a real good assessment today um, to, to get a good feel of all of those joints. We'll also do a CT scan with her while we have her here at the hospital to just evaluate how those um, joints are doing and make sure that we're able to manage her comfortably as she gets older. Um, so Dr. Jurig has helped us out with a number of different procedures over the year. And just earlier this morning, um, we actually had Samson, one of our Amur Tigers over here at the hospital uh, for a dental checkup on that animal as well. So our team does the basic dental health care, um, any sort of routine cleaning, small minor procedures our veterinarians take care of, but when we get into some of the more complex procedures, like in this case, an endodontic repair or a root canal, um, that's where Dr. Drew and his team really provide a, a great set of uh, hands to help us out with. Uh, Dr. Jurega is a board certified veterinary dentist. So just like uh, human medicine, where there's different specialty fields like cardiology, neurology, ophthalmology, uh, veterinarians can specialize the same way. So where our team here at the zoo is specialized in the practice of zoo and wildlife medicine, Dr. Drega specialized in the veterinary dentistry. So uh, he does a wide variety of uh, more advanced dental procedures that our team's just not really uh, has the background to take on. Um, so Dr. Driga, it looks like we're, we're in the middle of a root canal here is what it looks like you're starting out. Um, what's your thought as far as the, the break here on this tooth? Is this a fairly straightforward repair that we're going to be looking at? Uh, generally, we'll uh, perform root canal therapy to save the function of a crown of a tooth. Um, but in our zoo animals, we are selecting a least invasive technique in which we will preserve the root in the mandible and not have an open wound or a surgical wound and extract the tooth. So we're entering the canal with a series of files. We're gonna sterilize and irrigate the canal with an irrigating solution that human dentists use. And then we'll fill the canal with inert material to seal it. Um, put a two layer um, restoration, tooth colored, similar to what we would receive when we have cavities. So it's gonna be about a, uh, a 40 to 60 minute procedure in cleaning out that canal before we start the filling process. But it's, um, a good candidate, I'm glad you guys identified it so early. Yeah. So obviously very big teeth on these guys, so this is a little bit bigger than what uh, you're used to in your office, which is why you're out here with us, is that it's uh, a bit of a procedure for us to take an animal like this off zoo ground. So we're always incredibly grateful when the specialists that work with us are able to come out here to the zoo and 
do these procedures. Um, it's a long anesthetic procedure for this animal just in general, but if we also had to transport that animal off of zoo grounds uh, to have this done somewhere else, it really extends the length of that anesthesia pretty dramatically. So uh, in addition to Dr. Driga's assistance on the dental standpoint, we've also got a host of other veterinary specialists that help us. We have veterinary cardiologists, ophthalmologists, um, surgeons that come in and work with us um, when we get into some of the more advanced procedures that uh, are a little outside of the specialty field that our veterinarians here at the zoo are accustomed to on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Amur uh, tigers, like I said earlier, are uh, one of the most endangered subspecies of tigers. There's less than uh, 500 of these animals left in the wild right now. So. Uh, every individual animal is a, a very important animal, and uh, the breeding population within uh, North American zoos is about 100 animals right now. Um, so it's a fairly small population both in zoos, but a really small population in the wild. And these are really a uh, very critically endangered animal. They're faced with a lot of different threats, um, but the biggest ones are really related to habitat loss and illegal hunting. So. These animals are actually uh, found in uh, far, uh, the far eastern parts of Russia and China um, in a climate that's much more uh, similar to what we would find here in the Chicagoland area. So we often think of tigers as being jungle cats and some of the other subspecies are definitely found in those jungle regions. This particular subspecies though is found in more of a temperate uh, deciduous forest, very similar to what we would have here in the Chicago area. So they're a cold adapted species so when you see photos of tigers in snow it's usually this particular species of tiger that um, you're seeing a picture of and uh, with their uh, with their lifestyle being adapted to live in those types of forests they're very dependent on the animals that live in those forests as their food species so when we have a lot of deforestation and a lot of loss of forest habitat it takes away the prey that these animals depend on to survive in the wild um, there's also still a tremendous amount of illegal poaching of these animals and illegal hunting. So um, one of the biggest things that's being done from a conservation standpoint with these particular cats is just protection of that habitat and trying to preserve as much of it as we possibly can. Um, the populations of these animals have taken just an absolutely dramatic decline over the last hundred years and um, their uh, loss of that habitat is really one of the driving re reasons for that. So. One of the most important things that uh, individual people can do to help these animals is, is to support the conservation organizations that are doing work in those areas and that are uh, protecting that particular habitat, that are um, helping people to find alternative uh, sources of income so that the poaching can be stopped, um, the illegal uh, deforestation from logging, um, trying to alleviate some of those pressures on these animals can really go a long way to um, providing space for these animals to live in the wild and protecting that population. Can oh yeah. Um, the red file would be one that a human dentist uses. It's 25 millimeters long. Our working dogs and police dogs use a 60 millimeter file, and our tigers and big cats use a 120 millimeter file. So everything's supersized. Quite a difference. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Can we, uh, can you show them the upper canine there just for perspective, don't you, Drega, just so people can get an idea of the size of these teeth that we're dealing with. And um, it's important to remember, like I said earlier, Melina here is about a 250 pound cat. So that's about the average size for a female of this subspecies. But the males can actually get up to about 650 pounds. So she's about half the size of a big male. So pretty impressive uh, size teeth there for sure. About two inches. Um, so just some other things that we take advantage of while we've got these animals under anesthesia is we obviously do a full exam and check everything, um, but we'll just take a look here at this foot just to let everybody see the claws as well. So our team's already taken a good look at the feet to make sure that everything's normal, but uh, like, your cow, uh, like your domestic house cat, um, tigers have retractable claws. So all species of cats except for cheetahs have the ability to actually retract their claw back. And what that does is it helps to preserve the tip of that claw to keep it sharp so that they, when they're hunting, they've got those claws available to grab hold of their prey and pull it down. And then when they're walking, they're not walking on the tips of those nails. So it helps keep them nice and sharp. But 
when we do an exam on them, we'll uh, make sure that we look at each individual claw, make sure that the nails are an appropriate length, that they don't need filed, or that there's no issues with anything in the foot. Um, obviously, a very impressively sized foot there. You can see my hand up against it just for comparison size there to give you an idea how big these paws are. Uh, how long has Melina been here? Um, so she's just been here a couple weeks at this point. So she's a very new arrival. Um, came to us from the Great Plains Zoo in uh, South Falls, South Dakota. Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Got my words mixed up there for me. Excuse me. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, so uh, they did a pre-shipment exam on her before she transported to make sure that she was in good health. So uh, the veterinarians at that zoo actually noted that she had damaged this tooth. So we knew that we were gonna need to do this procedure when we uh, brought her in. So that was why we were able to arrange to have Dr. Jeriga joining us here this morning and we're able to get all of this work done at one time. Normally these animals, uh, any new animal coming into the zoo gets a full health checkup upon arrival to make sure that we know exactly uh, how the animal is entering uh, the zoo in terms of health, any procedures or problems that we need to follow up on, medications that we may need to maintain the animal on. Um, as an older animal, I did mention already that Melina's got a little bit of arthritis in her joints, the same type of change that you know we would see in a, even an elderly person. Um, and with that, she's on a couple of different medications to help keep her comfortable so that that arthritis doesn't bother her as she gets older. Um, at its 10 years of age, she's definitely um, starting to get into her geriatric years. Um, these guys uh, in a zoo setting can live up to 14 to 16 years, so she's still got several years ahead of her, so we want to make sure that we're providing a, a comfortable quality of life during that time, and that as she does get older and start to develop some of these age-related changes, that we're managing those effectively. Uh, for those who just joined, can you tell us why she came to Brookfield Zoo? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the ways that uh, we're able to support the conservation for this species is by providing a home for some of the older animals. So right now um, we have one other amateur tiger here at the zoo and that's Whirl. Um, she's 13 years old. Um, she's not a reproductive animal at this point. So. Um, basically, we don't have a reproductive pair of uh, tigers right now, and since we're not breeding them, one of the ways that we can support the breeding population is by providing a home for some of the older animals, and that frees up space in other zoos that are able to breed these animals right now to be able to, to have the space that they need to provide the home for those animals. So. Um, definitely a little bit of an older animal for us to bring in, but we do this very regularly with a number of species um, to support different breeding programs and uh, either identify ourselves as a breeding population uh, site or a, a site that's just housing non-reproductive animals to provide a, a good quality home for them. Um, obviously, we strive to maintain all of our animals here at the zoo in the absolute best care that we possibly can and the best state of welfare. So we're very focused on making sure that we have the space to provide her with a comfortable home and then also obviously the, the highest quality of care that we can provide um, from a medical standpoint as well as just day-to-day -day care. And can you briefly tell us, what, well, I know, can you tell our viewers <laughs> where we are? <laughs> In the zoo? Yeah, so we're inside Tell us a little of, bit about the yeah, animal hospital. We're inside of Brookfield Zoo's animal hospital right now. Um, so we've got a team of veterinarians um, working with us, as well as Michelle and Ashley, two of our veterinary technicians that are working back here collecting some blood from Melina. Um, this is our uh, about a 20,000 square foot facility here at the zoo, and this is where we do all of the medical procedures. Um, for any animal that we can get here in the building. Um, obviously, you know, our tiger here is a fairly large animal, but even some of our bigger patients, we've had our pygmy hippos in the building, we've had our polar bears in the building, zebras, okapi, so really any animal up to a couple thousand pounds we can get here in the building. And we all, always prefer to work here in the hospital when we can, although if we need to go do something out in the zoo, we absolutely do that. For some of our biggest patients, that's really the only way that we can uh, get to them to provide health care. And so we'll mobilize whatever equipment and supplies we need to be able to do that. But working here in the hospital, we've got all of our equipment handy. It's really the way that we can provide the, the quickest care for our patients in a very safe way. And that quickness is important to us because our animals and our patients are all under anesthesia while we're working on them. Uh, we try and keep those anesthetic procedures as short as possible. 
That's why when you watch the videos of medical procedures happening, you'll often see a whole lot of things happening at once. I've had people describe it to me that it looks kind of like a race car coming in for a pit stop because there's multiple different teams of people that all jump out and do different things all at once. And that's really our, our best effort to try and minimize the amount of time that we have to keep an animal under anesthesia. So on an average day, how many procedures do you do? Here at the animal hospital? Yeah, that's a great question. It really depends on the day. Uh, no two days are alike for us here at the hospital, um, and it really depends what animal and what procedure we're working on. So for something like this, um, we had Samson, one of our leopards over here earlier today uh, for a dental issue so that Dr. Jurega could work on both of these patients at the same time. So we'll have these two animals as our major cases for the day, and then we'll have some smaller rechecks and other minor procedures um, in the afternoon today. So. On a day like today, we're probably only, only going to have maybe uh, five or six different patients that we're working on. But on a different day, if we're working on smaller animals, we might have uh, the entire flock of penguins over here at, at one point in time for uh, annual health checkup. Or we may be doing exams on uh, 15 to 20 smaller birds or lizard patients um, in the morning. So it really depends what's happening on any given day. Um, when we work on an animal like Layla or black rhinoceros, that pretty much takes our entire team to work on her because she's so big. Um, and that procedure can easily take almost the entire day just for, for one animal. Uh, do you yes. ever... So we're going to take yeah. a, Dr. Jurega is going to take an x-ray of this tooth here. So we're all just going to back up about six feet away from the animal so that we're not getting a, any unnecessary radiation. Um, we're just going to wrap up the back leg here where they're working on some blood collection and a catheter placement. So as soon as they've got that wrapped off, everybody's going to step away. And Dr. Drig is going to step in. This is a little portable x-ray generator here that we're using to take just a dental x-ray. So this is the exact same thing you or I would have done when we go to the dentist and they uh, take x-rays of your teeth. All right. And uh, so he's going to step aside and develop that x-ray. Uh, why is Melina missing a patch of fur on her leg? Uh, this was where we were uh, originally going to place a catheter, but the vessel did not stand up very well here on the front leg. So um, Ashley and Michelle have moved to a back leg for that catheter placement. So we did this. Um, usually if you're out here at the zoo and you see an animal with a little kind of small, perfectly square to rectangle shaped patch like that, that usually is where we've placed a catheter. Um, so it's not an issue or a concern that you need to worry about as far as the animal losing fur. Uh, do you ever do procedures on animals outside of the hospital? We do. We do all the time. Um, it really depends what the procedure is and, and sort of what the particular animal species is. So if it's a fairly simple procedure and it's something that we can do just while we're holding the animal without anesthesia, We'll often do those out in the, the zoo. Um, if it's a larger animal, if we're talking about something like a rhino or a giraffe or even an okapi or a nyala, we'll sometimes choose to do those in the animal's habitat just to reduce the anesthesia time and the transport time of moving that animal back here to the hospital. But um, even with some of those larger animals, we'll still often choose to bring them back here to the hospital just where it's a little more controlled environment for us. Uh, what are Michelle and Ashley working on over here? So Michelle and Ashley are working on a catheter there in the back leg, so just an intravenous catheter, and that's what we're running our fluids through. So you can see the catheter um, in the leg here, so it's wrapped in under this bandage right here, and it's just got an IV line coming out of it. So this is just like if you or I were in the hospital and hooked up to a fluids. Um, so we can see the bags of fluids here with the fluid pump uh, pushing some intravenous fluids into her. This is just something we do for a couple different reasons. One is to just help keep the animal's blood pressure up while they're under anesthesia and just maintain their circulation a little more naturally. Um, our animals are also fasted from food and water before they go under anesthesia, so she's not had anything to drink for a little while, so we're making up that uh, fluid volume by giving it just straight into her bloodstream. Would someone who's allergic to domestic cats also be allergic to a tiger or that other a, big cats? That is a great question. So I can speak to that one personally because um, I have some cat allergies myself um, if I get, uh, get it in my face. So uh, they do tend to make you um, kind of a little bit allergic in the same way that a house cat would. Um, if I were to really go nuzzle my face there into her fur, I would probably start to have a bit of a runny nose for the rest of the day. 
Uh, so she's currently living here at the animal hospital, correct? So yes, so the back of our animal hospital facility here um, has multiple different rooms attached to it. And so any animal that comes into the zoo um, stays here at the hospital um, for anywhere from two to four weeks um, length of time. And that's really a, got a couple different purposes. One purpose is to make sure that the animals are healthy because we don't want to have an ill animal come into the zoo that introduces any diseases into our um, animals here at the zoo. So we isolate them for a little period of time. Um, right now, everybody with uh, COVID taking place, everybody's very familiar with the terms quarantining and social distance right now. So it's kind of the same thing that um, we would just be trying to keep some distance between the animals at the zoo and the new animals coming in. Um, another reason is just to give the animals some quiet time to just kind of acclimate to new staff and a new uh, care team taking care of them on a daily basis as well as an adjustment in diet if we're changing what food we feed them um, and just to get used to how we do things here at Brookfield Zoo. So it's just a little bit of a quiet welcome period for the animals as they arrive. Um, during that period of time, all the animals get a full health checkup. Um, it lets us check blood work, uh, x-rays, get our hands on the animal, make sure there's no concern. And then we move them out from here to their normal habitat at the zoo. So if an animal like Melina were in their habitat, found out there was a problem, they were brought to the hospital, had a procedure done, how quickly after that procedure would they normally go back home? That's a good question. It, it really depends on what's going on in the individual animal. So if it were something simple like this, um, where we're just doing a root canal on a single tooth, um, in the case of Samson leopard that we worked on earlier, those animals usually go back to their habitat um, immediately after the procedure. Um, if it's something more serious, um, if it's an injured leg where we might have a broken bone that we're repairing, um, those animals may stay in the hospital for several weeks after the procedure, um, just so we can keep them in a quiet environment that's separate from the rest of the animals they may be in a group with. Um, it also lets us keep them in an environment that's um, just a little more controlled where they're not likely to re-injure themselves or potentially um, uh, go kind of crazy running around a large habitat. Um, if you think about a dog that has a surgery on a leg, the veterinarian will often tell you to, you know, leash lock some only and keep the animal in a small room so that it doesn't bounce off the walls. Um, it's the same thing for our animals. Um, we obviously can't uh, put them on a leash to take them for a walk in most cases, so we, uh, we compensate for that by just keeping them in a smaller space um, so that the uh, animals get the rest in the, the calm environment that they need. How do you do procedures on aquatic animals? Ah, that's a great question. It depends on the type of aquatic animal. So if we're talking about a, a dolphin, for instance, um, our dolphins are incredibly well, um, they've got an incredible relationship with their staff and there's a tremendous amount of medical behaviors that they'll do voluntarily for us. So they've been positively reinforced and trained to do a wide variety of different medical procedures. So they'll voluntarily give us blood samples, they'll voluntarily position for ultrasound exams, um, they'll let us see inside their mouth, they'll let us feel their bodies. Um, so in the case of those, for most of those procedures, it's a very easy um, assessment for us and very easy to work with them. Um, for our other marine mammals, our sea lions and our seals, They've also been trained for a number of different voluntary medical procedures so they can kind of participate with their own health care, so to speak, and make it simple on our team. Um, if it's something that does require anesthesia, we bring them over here to the hospital just like we would with Molina the tiger. So with those animals, marine mammals um, are mammals, so they breathe air just like you or I. So from an anesthesia standpoint, it's very simple and easy for us to work with those animals under anesthesia just like the tiger here. Um, if we're talking about our fish though, um, any of our true fish species, those animals obviously get their oxygen through the water, through their gills. So in those cases, we have an anesthesia system that actually dissolves anesthesia within the water. And then we'll actually bring those animals over and we can take them out of the water and continue to run water across their gills with a pump so that we're able to keep oxygenation going to their gills and keep them alive um, while they're out of the water for us to work on. How was Molina transported to the zoo? 
Um, so Melina was transported straight through. Um, she's actually got probably the best transportation for a cross-country trip of anybody um, because she's basically loaded into a, a small crate that um, loads into the back of a vehicle and then she was just driven straight through. So um, really no stops whatsoever. We try and make it as quick and efficient as possible. Um, our animals are usually acclimated to going into those enclosures beforehand so that they're comfortable with the space. It's not a, a negative experience where they're being forced into a kennel and um, are, are frightened or concerned about it. So they get acclimated to the enclosure, the enclosure is loaded, and then they're moved. I think we'll just do one more question. Sure. Um, will Melina and Whirl be living together and interacting with each other? So they'll be in the same building. Um, tigers by nature are solitary animals, so they're not like a lion that would you know, hang out in the pride with a number of other lions. Um, they tend to be solitary in nature unless they've got cubs with them. So while they'll be in the same building, they won't be uh, directly in with one another. Um, so thank you so much for joining us here. Um, at the zoo this morning. Uh, we always love having people come behind the scenes with us here in the animal hospital. Uh, we're very excited to have Melina here joining us at the zoo. Um, and we can't wait to be open again and have all of uh, our Brookfield Zoo family back out here to visit us. Um, once you are able to do so, when we get a little bit further along in, in reopening the state of Illinois, um, we hope you'll be out here to join us. Come out and see Melina and uh, we hope you uh, join us again tomorrow for bringing the zoo to you.